I, I first want to just express my, my appreciation and thanks to, um, to Judy Byron and Kyle Creason at, at the library, the, the Waterbury Public Library, and to the um, Vermont Humanities Council, which is co-sponsoring this presentation. Uh, the dedicated folks at the Vermont Humanities Council are, I consider them to be the stewards and benefactors and curators of the arts in Vermont. Um, and of culture in Vermont, and they, they really are our other gorgeous landscape, uh, and they deserve our generous support, so my, my gratefulness and thanks to them. Um, so, uh, let's see. Okay. So hopefully you're all seeing these, these slides. I'll be going back and forth from the slides. Um, so let me start by telling a little bit of my backstory and how I came to, um, to be interested and to write about this um, compelling and critical history. Uh, I'm, I'm a German Jew. I was, um, I was born after the war. My parents narrowly escaped the Holocaust and others in my family did not. Um, I was born after the war. Um, and lived in the Washington Heights section of New York City in Manhattan, where many of the German Jewish survivors of the war settled and lived. Um, my first language was German. I didn't speak English until I was five years old and started going to school. Um, the, the Holocaust for me as I was growing up was a, a baffling but iconic story of, for, of my childhood. It was it was a subject of nervous, hushed adult conversation. For me, the Holocaust was frightening. It was mysterious. It was impossible to grasp. It was everywhere. It was the atmosphere. There was an awkward gracelessness on the part of, the, of those adults who had lived through it a kind of furtiveness that I now understand to be a kind of a post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, denial, shame, hypersensitivity, flashbacks. It was the unacknowledged elephant in the living room, huge but shrouded. Uh, the way, a couple of examples of how this uh, silence manifested in my life, it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I learned that my grandfather had been arrested on Kristallnacht, November 9th, 1938, um, one of the first pogroms of the Nazis, um, and, had been in, and was imprisoned in Dachau. Um, he was there for six months until my grandmother was able to bribe him out of Dachau because she went to high school with one of the administrative guards at Dachau, and he accepted a bribe. Um, in 1999, my parents were interviewed um, uh, as part of Steven Spielberg's Shoah project. Um, and it was during that interview that my mother produced her identity papers from, uh, from the war and from the Nazi era uh, with a stamped Jew. Um, I had never seen this before. She also sh um, showed her nursing certificate from the nursing school she went to in Frankfurt, which had swastikas on it. Um, again, my brother and I had never seen these artifacts. So it, it left me to wonder as I was growing up what my mission was vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust. I've always felt a, a deep sense of social mission, something I learned from my parents. My writing reflects this mission for social justice and public health. Um, as a medical student, I was active in the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam uh, War movement. Um, as a Vermont physician, I was part of the anti-nuclear movement. I was a, one of the New England delegates to Physicians for Social Responsibility. My first practice was in an underserved rural area in northern Vermont on the Canadian border, and I'm a primary care pediatrician now. I'm especially compelled by rescuers. Why would people put themselves and their families at risk of death to rescue strangers? Both of my books are about rescuers. My nonfiction, Life in a Jar, is about Irena Sendler, who rescued 2,500 Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto. My historical fiction, Before the Court of Heaven, includes the Varian Fry Rescue Network in wartime Marseille that enabled more than 2,000 anti-Nazi and Jewish refugees 
to flee Nazi-occupied Nazi Vichy France. Varian Fry, who was an American Quaker, was the first American who was recognized as righteous among the Gentiles by Yad Vashem, the Israeli Holocaust Authority. My, the protagonist of my historical fiction before the court of heaven is Ernst Teshoff. He's a fascist assassin. And rescue for him is much more complex because he first must turn from the evil that he has embraced. His redemption is catalyzed by an act of unfathomable forgiveness, and we'll get back to that a little later. So this is really an inquiry into um, not only the history of Weimar uh, Germany, but also of about forgiveness, atonement, and redemption. My, my title, Before the Court of Heaven, has a double meaning. I first heard this story of the redemption of Ernst Techau, a young fascist assassin in the early 20s, an early Nazi, as a, at a, as a Yom Kippur sermon at Middlebury College in 1992. Uh, these are the high holidays now, Yom Kippur is next Monday. Um, Yom Kippur is the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. It's a day of atonement. It's a day to plead before the court of heaven for forgiveness for sins against God. A day to turn from evil to redeem oneself. This, the, the enigmatic and quintessential prayer on Yom Kippur is called Kol Nidre. And it is, in reality, the, the legal formula for forgiveness before the court of heaven, before the sacred court of heaven. But sins against our fellow humans must be confessed and atoned person to person. So how does one do that after murdering someone? What does that atonement look like? The redemption that must precede, that is before the court of heaven. This is the secular court of heaven. Holocaust survivor and scholar Elie Wiesel said, who listens to a witness becomes a witness. When I wrote Life in a Jar and after interviewing Irena Sendler and some of the children that she rescued from the Warsaw Ghetto, I found my mission with regards to the Holocaust as a witness, tasked with telling this story in whatever way I could. Life in a Jar is nonfiction, about Irena Sendler and the three Kansas girls who rescued her forgotten story. Before the Court of Heaven is fiction inspired and informed by the history of how Germany's Weimar democracy became the Third Reich. This history is compelling and it is a cautionary tale for today. I'm troubled by what Spanish writer George Santayana said those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Santayana enjoins us to recognize the echoes of painful history and do what we can to prevent its recurrence. History is cyclical, but we can never anticipate how recurrence will manifest. It's never identical. I don't think Santayana got it quite right. History doesn't so much repeat as mutate not unlike the flu virus, and so we are unprepared for its return. The flu, in the flu pandemic of 1918, 50% of deaths were healthy young people. Healthy democracies, such as our 244-year experiment, are not immune to catastrophe. So uh, this slide is it, it's from an article by Jochen Bittner, who is a New York Times uh, columnist and a German uh, journalist, and he lays out what he considered to be the four conditions for the fall that cleared the path for the fall of the Weimar democracy and the rise of the Third Reich. Loss of trust in institutions, social humiliation, political blunder, economic distress. I would suggest, though not identical, these conditions exist again today. I'm a physician, I'm a scientist, I am evidence-based, 
I do not subscribe to conspiracy theories, but I worry. Today, democracy in all its manifestations is under assault and in retreat around the world. Authoritarian rule is increasingly prevalent and, disturbingly, increasingly acceptable. It is our unfortunate nature to project evil onto others as if we are not somehow capable of it ourselves. In considering the history of Nazi Germany, we do so at our peril. There was nothing unique or special about Germans. The Third Reich rose to power legally as a malignancy within Germany's Weimar democracy that followed World War I. Germany, an enlightened society, was the nation that brought us Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, Goethe, Bertolt Brecht, Thomas Mann, Schiller, but they also brought us Hitler and the Nazis. A plurality of Germans, 44%, voted for the Nazi party, and Hitler became chancellor in 1933 through a legal parliamentary process. The Weimar democracy, let's see, where we can come back here. The Weimar democracy lasted 14 years. Um, during that time, there were multiple political parties. At some points, there were in excess of 30 political parties. Um, during those 14 years, there were 13 chancellors, 21 administrations. The last three years of Weimar, there were four chancellors from 1930 to 1932. My mother was a 16-year-old Jewish girl living in Mainz at this time in January 1933 when Hitler came to power. She remembers people saying, oh, the Nazis, just another government. They won't last, enough. They won't last six months. Nothing to be concerned about. In Before the Court of Heaven, what I wanted to do was to get into the head of my protagonist, get into the head of a young Nazi, Ernst Teschoff. I rejected the usual omniscient point of view for a more unusual fixed point of view, that of Ernst alone. We are only with Ernst. We see the world through his eyes alone. We are in his eternal present from before World War I to the Holocaust and World War II. And through that point of view, I was able to explore the long arc of Ernst's atonement and redemption. And there is nothing facile about this complex and painful and harrowing process. A fixed point of view also allowed me to have an intimate connection of, with Ernst's family with Lisa, the love of his life, with his friends, his co-conspirators, and the community around him, and to try to understand how ordinary people became complicit in extraordinary crimes. This is not just one young man's aberration. This is the aberration of a nation. And in the background, the Weimar Republic and the gathering storm of Nazism. I carefully researched this history and submitted the manuscript before publication to, um, to scholars of history and the Holocaust at uh, Middlebury College and the University of Vermont Center for Holocaust Studies uh, to make sure that I was accurate in my depiction. This history is compelling and it's complex. I can only share a slice of it with you tonight. Puzzle pieces that will allow you to more fully appreciate both the hope and the tragedy of Germany's Weimar democracy. The echoes of this history that we hear today must be understood through the filter of history. We'll see how Hitler works his will legally and takes advantage of Weimar's vulnerabilities. He articulates ordinary Germans' fears, their rage at being defeated in World War I, their humiliation by the harsh terms of the Versailles Treaty, they have been left behind, they've been betrayed by a ruined economy, a degenerate culture, by women making free choices, by communists, Jews, Slavs, Romani, immigrants. Hitler gives voice to their fear of the other. He gives credibility to eugenic theories, 
that reinforce biases of Aryan superiority, which today would be called white supremacy. Jews, about 1% of the population of Germany, have always been a convenient scapegoat through history. In 1871, Bismarck granted the Jews of Germany a, um, a modicum of, um, of equality, but they remained a suspect minority. In exchange, the German people, ordinary people no different than you and me, gave Hitler the reins of a dictatorship that would carry out the Holocaust. The Holocaust really begins with Weimar's tragic failure before a single Jew is murdered. This was the time to act, to resist. It was civil passivity that allowed the Nazis to flourish. As historical fiction, before the court of heaven animates and illuminates the history of Weimar and the rise of the Third Reich, three themes informed my writing. First, how and why did Germans in a constitutional democracy with free elections and the rule of law choose Hitler and the Nazis? Second, to investigate this, uh, the unfathomable forgiveness, which I'll get to in a little bit, and its consequences. And finally, the complexity of redemption. My hope is that by animating this history, readers will understand it in a visceral way so we don't have to repeat it. My fiction it explores the capacity inherent in each of us for unspeakable horror and remarkable goodness, our devils and our better angels. We too have choices to make. By gazing into the imperfect but compelling mirror of history, we better understand the present. Consider my two epigraphs. The first is by Picasso, Art is a lie which makes us realize the truth. And the second by Wally Lamb from his novel, This One Thing I Know is True. What are our stories if not the mirrors we hold up to our fears? Germany's Weimar democracy suffered from economic anxiety, cultural quarrels and political polarization. Germans hoped and Hitler promised, and this is a quote from one of Hitler's speeches in 1926, to return Germany to its national greatness. Ordinary citizens responded to the appeal of demagogues who used fear, populism, xenophobia, nationalism, bigotry, and scapegoating, and promised that a law and order authoritarian ideology would save Germany from its decline at the hands of the other. Hitler's campaign depended on fear, utilizing inaccurate historical analyses and outright lies to mobilize a vulnerable population. He delegitimized and demonized the press. He demeaned the judiciary. Joseph Goebbels, his, his propaganda minister, developed a propaganda campaign of savage efficacy. One of the things he did was to employ these cheap radios. Radio was a new technology at the time. Um, similar in some ways to Twitter, and was able to skillfully exploit uh, this as a means of spreading propaganda to the population. But it wasn't all Hitler. He was necessary but not sufficient for the rise of Nazism. There were at least two other phenomena. First, that the German people chose Hitler and the Nazis, and second, that the Weimar democracy contained the seeds of its own destruction. And we have to understand this history as an immunization against recurrence. So uh, this is a, a cartoon from an Austrian postcard from 1919. Um, and historians generally agree that Hitler's murderous anti-Semitism emerged after World War I as the product of a paranoid stab in the back explanation for Germany's defeat. That is, the German army didn't lose the war, it was betrayed by civilians on the home front, the so-called November criminals. These so-called backstabbers, the treasonous betrayers, are intellectuals, politicians, 
degenerate artists, socialists, communists, and in this cartoon, Jews. The stab in the back myth, or these are another form of alternative facts, inspires populist anger and is encouraged by the right-wing establishment. And the right-wing establishment consists of monarchists who want to see the Kaiser return to the throne, conservative elites and wealthy power brokers, financiers and bankers, military officers, large agricultural estate owners, the so-called Juncker class, and those who run large industries, coal, steel, construction, and armaments. The harsh and humiliating Versailles Treaty that ended World War I is, in hindsight, the fertilizer for the rise of the Nazis and the Third Reich. The fledgling Weimar democracy struggles with political fragmentation and gridlock among extremes on the right and left. Before the Court of Heaven starts here with the man Ernst Teschoff helped to murder on June 24th, 1922, Foreign Minister Walter Rottenau, the highest ranking Jew in the Weimar Republic and the target of right-wing anti-Semitic fury. It is four years after the end of World War I. Germany is a constitutional democracy. Rottenau, an industrialist, philosopher, writer, politician, and statesman, an assimilated German Jew, describes himself as German first, Jewish last. These are difficult economic times for Germany. Hyperinflation, unemployment, rage at their defeat in World War I, humiliation by the Versailles Treaty and its crushing reparations. The stab in the back myth is the quintessential right-wing rallying cry. Antisemitism also has changed in the post-war period. For more than a thousand years, antisemitism had been religious. A 19th century German might say, we hate the Jews because of their religion. Judaism is an affront to Christianity. Jews killed Jesus. Jews make matzah from the blood of Christian children. This is the so-called blood libel from the Middle Ages. In the post-war period, antisemitism takes on the, the added dimension of racial bigotry against Jews as a genetically distinct and inferior race, so-called untermensch, or subhumans. A German after World War I might explain I hate the Jews because they are genetically inferior. Jews will interbreed and degrade the pure German race. This racism is reinforced by eugenic science, much of which comes from American scientists. The eugenics movement's influence increased in response to the flood of immigrants coming to the US at the turn of the century. Catholics, Irish, Jews, um, I, uh, the Yale professor James Whitman um, wrote a book uh, about two years ago that's called Hitler's American Model, the U.S. and the Making of Nazi Race Laws. And what he posits in this book is that Hitler and the Nazis were inspired by United States Jim Crow era laws, by segregation, by um, uh, bans against, uh, against intermarriage, by lynchings, and by white supremacy. There's a Vermont connection here too, because it, uh, I, like in 1912, um, our governor, um, John Mead, who was a physician, was also a champion of eugenics. And uh, he, um, he was the one who was responsible for the Brandon Training School, which was called the State School for the Feeble-Minded at Brandon. Um, recently, the uh, UVM's Bailey Howe Library was renamed as the Howe Library. Guy Bailey's name was struck from it um, because he was a um, he, he was a Vermont Secretary of State and the president of UVM. Um, uh, but in the early 20th century, um, he was also a leader in the eugenics movement and was a profound racist. Two months before Rothnow is assassinated. He does the unthinkable. He negotiates a treaty, the Treaty of Rapallo with Russia, that normalizes relations with Germany. Right-wing politicians and the right-wing press condemn this treaty, which they view as treason. It's a compromise with the Russian communist revolutionaries. Their anger and bitterness motivates fascist assassins associated with the secret 
murderous organization consul, also called the Black Reichswehr, the Black Army, Black Reich Army. My protagonist, Ernst Teschoff, is one of those murderers, those assassins. And on June 24th, 1922, Ratten Rathenau is killed. Huge crowds mourn Rathenau's death. He was a beloved statesman. Flags are at half mass. Workers stage mass demonstrations in mourning and protest. The Reich president, Friedrich Ebert, issues a decree for the protection of the Republic that creates a special court that finally brings an end to the organization consul murders. This is a photograph of the organization consul trial. Um, uh, organization co consul was, uh, was referred to as organization C um, popularly. Uh, this was a, a trial that was, um, uh, it was on the, in all of the papers of the world. It was a sensational, um, sensational trial. The um, uh, defendant number two, uh, who's highlighted, that's my protagonist. That's Ernst Teschoff. Uh, defendant number six is his brother, Hans Gerd Teschoff. I felt, when I heard this story, I felt compelled by his, by the story of his turn from evil and his redemption. And I sought primary evidence. Um, I was able to obtain um, microfilm transcripts from the National Archives of Ernst Teschoff's arrest, his interrogation, and this trial. Some of these notes were handwritten. There's a scan of one of these notes. They, they were all in German, so I had to sit and translate all of these, and I had the, the, the help of Marita Schein, a dear friend of mine who was a, a German woman, and uh, we sat and, and translated them word by word. Um, I read newspaper accounts and scholarly works about the assassination, the trial in Weimar, Germany, and this history grew larger, more distinct, astounding. Ernst's trial, this organization consul, organization C trial, was actually the trial of 13 mostly young fascists and violent nationalists, early Nazis, whose mission was to destroy the fledgling Weimar democracy. This 1922 organization consul trial is a window on the tumultuous early years of Germany's Weimar Republic, and it reveals the earliest omens and manifestations of Nazism festering within this fragile democracy. My account of the organization consul trial is mostly creative nonfiction rooted in these transcripts. I could not have made up the drama, the twists and turns, the outrageous behavior of the defendants. The turning point in this trial and in my novel is a letter of forgiveness from Rottenau's elderly mother, Matilda Rottenau, who attends Ernst's trial. Before he is sentenced, she asks that her letter to Ernst's mother be read aloud in court. And I'm going to read this letter to you. Actually, I'll, I'll read a section of this, a, um, a, a, a brief from the book. Um, Dr. Hahn in this reading is Ernst's lawyer. For the first time in two weeks of proceedings, Frau Rottenau's chair in the gallery was conspicuously empty. Dr. Hahn adjusted his reading glasses. He began, Frau Rottenau addressed this letter to Frau Teschoff on July 3rd, only nine days after the assassination. My dear Frau Teschoff, in grief unspeakable, I give, my, I give you my hand, you of all women the most pitiable. Say to your son that in the name and spirit of him he has murdered, I forgive even as God may forgive if before an earthly judge he make a full and frank confession of his guilt and before a heavenly one repent. Had he known my son, the noblest man earth bore, he would rather have turned the weapon on himself than on him. May these words give peace to your soul. Matilda Rathenau. The silence in the courtroom, as dense as fog on the hovel, was metered by the subtle beat of ceiling fans, a woman coughed in the shadow under the balcony. It seemed a signal for everyone to exhale at once, 
their breath becoming the rustle of clothes, the clearing of throats, sniffles, white handkerchiefs fluttering. Dr. Hahn folded the letter carefully, then wiped his pince-nez and said, Ernst Teshoff has confessed the whole truth to his earthly judges, and he will answer before his heavenly judge. I ask the court to pass judgment in the spirit of Frau Rottenau's letter. Ernst looked to the empty chair from which Frau Rottenau had presided over the court as surely as the judges. He resisted her words, but they pried into him like a thief picking the lock of his heart. This actual letter in my fiction becomes Oh, this, by the way, is, is from the front page of um, a, a major German newspaper, and it reprints Frau Rodnau's letter um, in the middle. And, and this, this was in virtually every newspaper in the world. It was such a dramatic moment um, and a poignant uh, moment. Um, but this letter becomes the catalyst for Ernst's complex and harrowing redemption. Ernst escapes the death penalty. He's sentenced to 15 years. He only serves seven. Um, at this time, the judiciary in Germany was, was more right-wing. They were pretty lenient with right-wing um, defendants and were more harsh with, with leftists. So one of the questions that came to me that I was, how did Ernst become a fascist assassin? He was, uh, uh, he was born to a, a wealthy family, the son of a magistrate. People are not born murderers, they're not born Nazis, they are, they are taught. I considered the indoctrination of young people, the youth culture in Germany before World War I. My characters, Ernst, Lisa, and Fritz, spend childhood summers as Wandervogel, Wandering Birds, a popular German youth movement dating back to the 19th century. If the intention of the Van der Vogel youth movement is summed up in its slogan, Blood and Soil, Blut und Boden, which became a Nazi slogan ominously resurrected in Charlottesville, Virginia, two years ago. It expresses the 19th century German idealization of a racially defined national body, the blood, united with a settlement area, the soil, the fatherland. Rural and farm life are idealized as a counterweight to the nomadism and elitism of urban Jewish immigrants, of communists, of intellectuals. This is peasants versus the urban asphalt culture. It is, these, this German youth movement is specifically racist and anti-Semitic. The concept of Lebensraum, the belief that the German people needed to reclaim historically German areas in Eastern Europe into which they could expand is tied to it. Jews cannot own land um, and therefore they were, they lived mostly in urban um, areas. The ethos of these youth movements was to get back to nature and freedom, to shake off restrictions of society, to celebrate Germany's heroic Teutonic roots and past. What began as an innocent German youth movement, the Wandervogel, became the Hitler Youth. So let's get back to, the, back to this history. And I'm gonna return to, return to World War I. The, at that time it was the Great War and Germany's defeat. Uh, after the, the Russian Revolution in 1917, the Eastern Russian Front collapsed and Germany redoubled its military efforts on the Western Front. A spring offensive began, a German spring offensive began in March of 1918, which brought the German army within 40 miles of Paris. I think it's not appreciated how close Germany came to winning the war at that point. And it was only when the United States entered the war in April of 1917 and joined this, uh, this to push back this offensive that the tide turned. But by the summer of 1918, the outcome of the war was teetering in the balance. 
When the Allies finally beat back this offensive in October of 1918, Germany was on the verge of defeat. Um, on October 28th, 1918, the German High Command, in a desperate final effort, ordered the formidable German fleet to attack the blockading British Navy. The British had blockaded the Germans for two years, since 1916, in the Battle of Jutland. This is a remarkable bit of history and all true. Germany is still a monarchy under Kaiser Wilhelm II. Ernst is a politically naive 17-year-old new cadet naval officer with command over sailors manning the boiler room of the battle cruiser Helgoland, which was one of these battle cruisers that you see here at the blockaded Kiel naval base. As they're preparing, as the officers are getting ready to prepare the sailors for, um, for turning their boats to attack the British, there's a mutiny throughout the fleet. The sailors refuse their orders and they lay down their, um, well, air, in Ernst's case, he was in the boiler room, they lay down their shovels, they refuse um, orders to participate in the attack. And the mutiny is successful. Within a week, the socialist red flag flies above every naval vessel in Kiel and Wilhelmshaven. A week later, the German war effort collapses. Kaiser Wilhelm abdicates the throne, Germany is declared a republic and surrenders and signs the armistice on November 11th, 1918. At the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month, the great war is over. But in Germany, there is no peace. A revolution has begun. The mutiny, Germany's surrender and the armistice sweep away the monarchy of Kaiser Wilhelm and the German democracy is born. But it's a fragile infant, fatally infected at birth by extremes of the right and the left. Two days before the armistice is signed, Kaiser Wilhelm abdicates the throne, and the German Republic is mistakenly announced and declared on November 9th. This is that moment. This is a photograph of the Reichstag, and there is a giant demonstration of crowds out, gathered outside the Reichstag. Uh, the Reichstag is the, the parliament building of, the, of, of Germany. Um, it's lunchtime, and the social democratic minister and the deputy leader, Philip Scheidemann, hears a rumor that communists are about to declare Germany a Soviet republic. These are the communists and the socialists who engineered the mutiny and the, the collapse of the war effort. In a panic to preempt this declaration, he rushes to, a bal to this balcony and makes a spontaneous speech to thousands who are gathered outside that closes with these words, the old and rotten, the monarchy has collapsed, the new may live, long live the German Republic. When he returns to the, to the Reichstag dining room, the chancellor, Ebert, is furious. He pounds the table with his fist and he shouts, you have no right to proclaim the Republic. What becomes of Germany, a Republic or whatever, that is for the Constituent Assembly to decide. But it's too late. The Republic is prematurely born and the German Revolution escalates. Ernst's brother, Leo, is a socialist. He joins the mutineers. A revolutionary sailors council takes control of the base. More than 40,000 sailors, soldiers, and dock workers are involved in the mutiny. Word spreads and more join the revolt. Representatives of the mutineers disperse to all major German cities. Soldiers and sailors councils are formed in days all over Germany with diverse demands. This, uh, each one of these dots is where another um, of these revolutionary, these mostly Soviet communist inspired soldiers and sailors councils um, were formed and the, the dates and they're all within about 10 days of the mutiny. That's how fast this spread through, through the nation. There are pitched battles in the street. 
in the anxiety of the moment when a communist revolution is poised to overthrow the government, the chancellor, Ebert, makes a fatal, if understandable, misstep, a political blunder. He forms an alliance with extreme right-wing paramilitary militias called the Free Corps. As many as 50,000 freebooters, as they call themselves, to take military action against the revolutionary councils. Some of these freebooters are veterans of the Great War. Others, like my protagonist Ernst, are too young to have fought, but are eager to defend Germany against communists and Jews. And their goal is, the, the goal of the Free Corps is to not only save Germany from becoming a Soviet Republic, but to restore the monarchy. Ernst becomes a member of the Free Corps. This is the New York Times from November 12th, the day after the armistice is signed, and, and just gives you a sense of, uh, of, of what chaos is, is reigning in Germany. Um, the, the headline is Armistice Signed, End of the War. Berlin seized by revolutionists. New chancellor begs for order. Ousted Kaiser flees to Holland. With all of this chaos, the armistice must be signed. And the, and the government accepts the Allies' harsh terms for a truce. And um, on November 11th, the, uh, the Center Party deputy, a man named Matthias Erzberger, signs the Armistice Agreement. He was assassinated in 1921 for doing this by Organization C, the same group assassinated Rothenau. Mutinous soldiers joined with the workers. These are many of the soldiers returning from the war. They're a defeated army. These are the so-called Spartacists. The German communists call themselves Spartacists, taking the name of the Roman slave Spartacus, who in 72 BC led a revolt against the Roman state. They're led by Karl Liebknecht and Red Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg. During the last two months of 1918, there is a standoff between the German government and the left-wing revolutionaries. The government's patience wears thin. The defeated German soldiers returning from the war are ordered to fight the communists, but the war is lost. They're tired, dispirited. It's almost Christmas. Many refuse to fight and they disperse. To take their place, Germany's chancellor unleashes the Free Corps throughout Germany. Uh, photographs of street, street fighting in Berlin with uh, the, the Free Corps against the communists. There were uh, street demonstrations and huge marches demanding um, from, from the, the communists calling for revolution. Uh, this was taken two days before Christmas in 1918. Uh, mutinous sailors storm the German government offices, the chancellery, the royal palace, and the royal stables. They seize three ministers as hostages. Communist rallies fill the streets. These are Spartacus um, at Berlin's Marstall stables, the royal stables. There's more violence. Ernst is a freebooter in the most violent and feared Free Corps unit, the Marine Brigade Earhart. His unit is about to storm these stables, the royal stables, um, that have been seized by the revolutionaries. Ernst's family, riven by the polarizing politics of the day, his older brother Leo might be in the royal stables. Ernst doesn't know. He worries that he's about to attack um, and may be shooting at his brother. After an initial artillery assault by the Free Corps, there's a brief truce, and then something remarkable happens. A crowd of left-wing demonstrators, mostly women and children, infiltrate the Army and Free Corps ranks and convince many of the Army soldiers, the Wehrmacht, to throw down their weapons. No one has the stomach to shoot civilians, and the attack is called off. The Freebooters, the Free Corps, retreat and are humiliated by the demonstrators. The new year, 1919, brings another wave of street fighting, and once again, the left-wing revolutionary Spartacists 
threaten the a defeated and vulnerable Germany. Their goal to create a Soviet revolutionary state in the image of Soviet Russia. Soldiers, sailors, and workers take to the barricades for armed struggle. Once again, the army is called in and many of the defeated soldiers again refuse to fight against their brothers. There are huge demonstrations. The surging masses carry placards and banners pleading with the army troops, Bruder, nicht schießen, brother, don't shoot. Germany's new democracy has made a devil's bargain with the Free Corps, who are eager to fight those who have betrayed Germany. Fifteen years later, these Free Corps soldiers, these freebooters, will become Nazi stormtroopers and leaders of the Nazi party. There are pitched street battles between Free Corps soldiers and Spartacus revolutionaries in what comes to be known as Spartacus Week. Chancellor Ebert orders the Free Corps to strike and they overwhelmingly and brutally attack several occupied buildings. Ernst's unit attacks the Vorwärts newspaper building, one of the largest newspapers in Germany. Freebooters are ruthless, executing occupiers after they surrender. The January fighting claims more than a thousand lives in Berlin. The leaders of the revolution, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, are arrested and summarily executed by Free Corps officers. Ernst is a witness to Red Rosa's execution. This is Captain Hermann Erhardt, the most feared and respected Free Corps commander of Marine Brigade Erhardt, the one that Ernst belonged to. After the Free Corps is demobilized, because uh, it was one of the terms of the Versailles Treaty, he forms the Secret Murderous Organization Consul, Organization C, for which Ernst is a driver and accessory to murder. The unholy alliance of Weimar politicians and the Free Corps succeeds in suppressing the leftist uprisings throughout Germany. The country is mostly pacified by August of 1919, when Germany's new constitution is ratified in the city of Weimar, hence the Weimar Republic. Friedrich Ebert, Germany's first ever democratically elected president, is a commoner, a socialist, and a civilian. In the Weimar Constitution, there's a poison pill, and it is Article 48. And this is what it says. It allowed for authoritarian rule in an emergency. According to the Constitution, the chancellor is the head of state and runs the government. But in an emergency, the president has emergency powers from Article 48, under which he becomes the commander in chief of the armed forces. As head of the military, the president can bypass the parliament and rule by decree. This power is misused often between 1930 and 1933, before the rise of Hitler, when the Reichstag is so polarized, so gridlocked, that it cannot govern. In 1920, the first year of the Weimar Republic, the Treaty of Versailles limits Germany's army to 100,000 men and the Free Corps is officially disbanded. Aside from these treaty or obligations, the new Weimar Republic, the leaders of the, of the Republic now, feel threatened by the Free Corps and thinking that they, could too, they too could be overthrown by them. The reason for the, Free Corps, for the, for the creation of this, uh, this alliance with the Free Corps was to crush leftist uprisings and that has been accomplished. The Free Corps is ordered to disband but it goes underground as organization consul, which then begins this reign of terror, assassinating enemies of the extreme right. Between 1919 and 1922, more than 350 people are assassinated for political reasons. The two most notable victims are in 1921, the politician who signed the 1918 armistice, Matthias, Matthias Erzberger, and in 1922, Walter Rothnow. But where is Hitler in all of this? After his service in World War I, Hitler returns to Munich and remains in the army. In July of 1919, he's an intelligence officer assigned to infiltrate a right-wing German uh, political party called the German Workers' Party. 
While monitoring the activities of this party, Hitler is attracted to the founder, Anton Drexler, and his nationalist, anti-Semitic, anti-Marxist, anti-capitalist philosophy. Um, Drexler invites him to join the party, and he is, um, he is member number 55. Um, so that was July 1919. By February of 1920, about six months later, this, this party becomes the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or the Nazi Party. Hitler is discharged from the army, and he begins working full-time for the Nazi Party. Their headquarters are in Munich, which is a hotbed of anti-government German nationalists who are determined to crush Marxism and undermine the Weimar Republic. In 1922 is a time for Germany. There's unemployment, crushing war reparations that have to be paid, anger at the Versailles Treaty. The economy is collapsing. The mark is worthless. Hyperinflation begins in 1921, and it's a boon to the newly born Nazi party. Hyperinflation is caused by war debt, by suspension of the gold standard, printing money, harsh reparations. To give you a sense of the dimensions of this inflation, in 1914, 4.2 German marks bought one US dollar. In 1923, 4.2 trillion marks bought one US dollar. This the photograph on the left is of children playing with worthless marks. Um, on the right, this gentleman has a wheelbarrow full of currency, enough to buy a loaf of bread. In 1921, at the start of hyperinflation, Hitler is granted absolute power as Nazi party chairman. He begins giving speeches, starts with beer halls and gets to larger audiences. He especially appeals to rural Protestant Germans. He speaks to thousands. He becomes adept at, call, at using populist themes, including the use of scapegoats, who are blamed for Germany's economic hardships. He rants about a particular document, the Protocol of the Elders of Zion. This is a fabricated anti-Semitic text purporting to describe a Jewish conspiracy for global domination. It was first published in Russia in 1903, and it became a critical influence on Hitler's thinking during this period. Uh, this screed was uh, distributed and financed by the Nazi party, and in the United States, Henry Ford printed a half a million copies of this Protocol of the Elders of Zion and distributed it. Um, just as, a, as an aside, um, I think I'm, I'm thinking about QAnon, um, where top Democrats are, are purportedly uh, uh, or alleged to have been sexually torturing children and harvesting adrenochrome, a, a life-extending hormone from their blood. This is the, the same blood libel from, uh, from 100 years ago and from almost 1,000 years ago. On the fifth anniversary of the armistice, this is November 9th, 1923, Hitler attempts a coup in Munich. It's, this is called the Beer Hall Putsch which is the word for coup in German. Along with 2,000 Nazis, he takes control of parts of Munich, arrests the president of Bavaria and the chief of police. He forces them to endorse the Nazi objective of overthrowing the Weimar Republic. The army is called in and the police, they put down this rebellion after a confrontation in which 16 Nazis and four policemen are killed and Hitler is arrested. He is arm in arm with his political advisor, Max von Schubner Richter, who is killed. I've often wondered if they had only held arms on the other side, how different history would be. There were three benefits that accrued to Hitler from, his, from this failed Beer Hall Putsch. First, his 24-day trial gave Hitler the attention of the German nation and a platform for his nationalist philosophy. Hitler is found guilty of treason. He's sentenced to five years in Landsberg prison, where he, is, uh, where he is treated as an honored guest. He even gains weight in prison. Um, the second benefit was that in prison, he dictated Mein Kampf. Um, he dictates it to Rudolf Hess, who writes it down. Um, 
Hitler is released after only nine months in prison in 1924. The, the final benefit, and maybe the most profound, is Hitler's insight that the path to power is through legitimate means rather than revolution or force. So this is 1924. Hitler is still a footnote. He's a, a transient extremist. He's a crackpot. In the um, December 1924 elections, the Nazis only get 3% of the vote. He is considered by journalists to be a buffoon, a pathetic dunderhead, a half insane radical. There is also a cultural dimension to Weimar that encourages the rise of Nazism. In the 1920s, Germany emerges as a leading center of the avant-garde. It's the birthplace of expressionism in painting. Kandinsky, Franz Marc, Paul Klee, the atonal music of Arnold Schoenberg and Alban Berg, the jazz-influenced works of Paul Hindemith and Kurt Weill, experimental films such as The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu, bring expressionism to cinema. In 1928, the premiere of the Three Penny Opera, Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill. This is a photograph of the first Dada Fair in Berlin in 1920. Dada is a radical modern art movement. Um, it's a, it's, it is the art form of chaos and irrationality, of destruction and sacrilege. It's a reaction to the horrors of World War I and the post-war economic and moral crisis. It's very weird. It's influenced by Cubism, Picasso, Brock. It is anti-war and anti-nationalist, and it's associated with the extreme left. The, in this photograph, the mannequin hanging from the ceiling is, a, is, is dressed in a, in a German officer's uniform, but has the head of a pig. George Grosch is a prominent member of the Berlin Dada group. He's a communist. He draws biting caricatures of fat businessmen, wounded soldiers, prostitutes, sex crimes, and orgies. The expatriate African-American performer Josephine Baker is an overnight sensation in Berlin's risque cabaret scene in 1925. There, there's a scene in uh, Before the Court of Heaven, a, a, ca a cabaret scene, uh, from 1921, which I just had the most fun writing that the, the excesses of the cabaret scene were truly dramatic. The Nazis view Weimar's cultural experimentation with disgust. It is degenerate art. It's the product of a degenerate new culture. Their response stems partly from a conservative aesthetic, but also, and more importantly, from their determination to use culture as a propaganda weapon. In this regard, they draw the support of the Protestant church against secular liberal culture and liberal excess. 1924 to 1929 are the golden 20s in Germany. After the end of hyperinflation, the currency is stabilized and the German economy thrives. It's not a good environment for Hitler's Nazis. Between the elections of 1924 and 1928 in this thriving economy, the minuscule Nazi share of the vote declines from 3% to 2.6%. Hitler is still a footnote. The weight that finally breaks Weimar's back is the 1929 stock market crash and the Great Depression. Germany suffers more than most industrial countries. Hitler and the Nazis prepare to take advantage of the emergency to gain support. They make elaborate promises to repudiate the Versailles treaty, rescue the economy, provide jobs, keep immigrants out, reclaim lost territories in Europe and colonies in Africa, and purify German culture. Photograph of electioneering. Again, these are perfectly legal election, uh, election times that the Nazis are participating in. This is the election of September 1930 one year after the, after the crash, and the Nazis now win 18.3% of the vote. They're the second largest party in the Reichstag. The next election is 18 months later, in April 1932, the depths of the depression. 40% of Germans are unemployed. 
Hitler has the support of industrialists. He runs for president and he finishes second with 37% of the vote. He's doubled his vote in less than two years. Now he is a force to be reckoned with. Six months later, in the November 1932 German federal elections, Hitler and the Nazis take more than one third of the seats in the Reichstag. A crisis in gover of government ensues because no party is able to form a coalition government. Finally, the chancellor, with the support of the president, Hindenburg, agrees to form a cabinet, uh, uh, to form a government with Hitler as the chancellor. It would later come out that these men consider Hitler to be a buffoon. They think they can control and manipulate him, use him as a tool to further their own ends. In January of 1933, Hitler legally becomes the chancellor. Here is how quickly a democracy becomes a dictatorship. A month after Hitler becomes chancellor, the Reichstag is set afire, maybe by a lone deranged Dutch anarchist or by the Nazis themselves. James Madison, our fourth president, warned, tyranny arises on some favorable emergency. The February 27, 1933 Reichstag fire in Berlin was, for Hitler and the Nazis, just such a favorable emergency. Hitler blames the communists. He suspends civil liberties and begins mass arrests. He uses charges of terrorism as a catalyst for regime change. Concentration camps are established for political prisoners. At Hitler's urging and under Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution, President von Hindenburg enacts the Reichstag Fire Decree, which suspends basic rights and civil liberties and allows detention without trial. Activities of the German Communist Party are suppressed and more than 4,000 people are arrested. One week after the fire, the election, an election, March 5th, the Nazi party now wins 44% of the vote. Three weeks after this election, Hitler's government brings the Enabling Act to a vote in the newly elected Reichstag and Hindenburg signs it. The act gives Hitler's cabinet the power to enact laws, even ones that deviate from the Weimar Constitution, without the consent of the Reichstag for four years. The Third Reich is born. By the summer of 1934, one and a half years later, there are hundreds of thousands of Nazi opponents in concentration camps. Ernst was released from prison in 1930, and though conflicted about the Nazis, he works for Goebbels' newspaper, Der Angriff. He is a witness to the rise of the Nazis. His family struggles and finally accommodates to the Nazi takeover of Germany. So I want to conclude with a couple of thoughts. Uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, a champion of human rights, a friend of Martin Luther King, said of the Holocaust, some are guilty, all are responsible. How do we manifest our deeper sense of responsibility? Responsibility for every silence, every deferred response. We are all to some extent bystanders. Never again is too facile a response. The German word for bystander is Mitlaufer, and it translates as fellow traveler. For those who make accommodations with evil, ordinary people becoming complicit in extraordinary crimes. When I read Holocaust literature, the question, the speculation that becomes my emotional atmosphere is, what would I have done? We hear an echo of Weimar today in our political discourse. No one of us can reverse this disturbing reverberation, but each one of us can do something, no matter how small, to promote decency and respect for all people, to be the civil opposition when tyranny once again raises its ugly head. George Santayana warned us to remember history or repeat it. Some choose to willfully forget or ignore history. Before the court of heaven is one small effort to keep that dark history alive as a cautionary tale for today. It has been said that Nazism and the Holocaust might have been unstoppable, but should have been unbearable. 
Where was the hue and cry from public and religious institutions, from citizens, that this was fundamentally wrong and unacceptable? We are confronted by genocide with sickening regularity. Cambodia, Darfur, the Congo, Bosnia, Sudan, Rwanda, Syria, Yemen, Myanmar, to name but a few. Perhaps the best we can hope for is to be active bystanders, upstanders, recognizing our responsibilities, forgiving ourselves for our failures, but indomitably pursuing social justice and righteousness when we can. I urge you to do whatever it is you can, no matter how small, to repair the world, to challenge hatred, intolerance, neglect, aggression, bullying, to advocate for decency. 2,000 years ago, a Hebrew sage, Rabbi Tarfan, said, it is not for us to finish the task, but neither are we free to desist from it. It is our charge to answer, what would I have done with, here's what I will do, to affirm justice, decency, respect for all people, and compassion as the expected norms of community, because not to do so would invite the repetition of painful history because not to do so would be unbearable. So thank you very much for your, your attention to this. Um, I'm sorry that ran a little over, but um, I'd be very happy to take questions, comments, whatever, from people. Um, can you, is this all working, Judy? <laughs> yes, I just unpinned you so people can, um, They'll show up on the screen when they speak, um, and I welcome uh, folks to ask any questions you like. I, I know for me, not being a historian, that was really um, helpful, and I, of course, see parallels to where we are today with some of the situations, um, with some of the, um, what, what was going on in Germany at that time. Um, so it was uh, incredibly interesting. I thank you so much for your research. Um, so if anybody would like to, you don't have to speak. If you want to write in the chat box, that's fine too. Um, I open it up. Don't be shy. Well, while, while we're waiting, let me just make one other comment here. I, you know, a lot of this focuses on the early years of, of what happened in Weimar. So much of the history of, of the Third Reich is about what happened after Hitler came to power. And that was too late. Once Hitler um, took, his, took, di took the powers of dictatorship, it, it, was, it, it was all over. There, there was no way of stopping him. So it was in these years, these Weimar years, that, that um, active resistance would have been effective. I like what you said, Jack, about um, you, you quoted um, Rabbi uh, Tarfon and um, just that we have to um, we have to do whatever we can. And I, I'm very grateful that we'll be able to um, get this video up for those that um, may, may not have been able to be with us tonight, because I think we do need to look at what is going on and there's so many parallels you know with unrest and violence and so forth and um i just think um i just loved how you ended your talk with positivity i appreciate that um, a lot of people are uh writing in the chat box um annika said um you mentioned that before the court of heaven comments on the chilling reality that decent people can become complacent with extraordinary crimes. What does it take to keep from falling into complacency in today's climate? Thank you, Annika. Mm -hmm. That's a really important question because it really gets to the heart of how um, how a, a minority of aggrieved individuals in a democracy can undermine um, that, that democracy. Um, it, it's, um, I, I have to admit for myself that I find myself baffled and astounded at what, what many people believe contrary to, to hard evidence. 
and how how people who have grievances and feel victimized by their circumstances by um, by a uh, by circumstances that are that are affecting them in a in in, in a uh, in negative way um, and how how that anger can then be turned into um, into the kind of, uh, of, of of politics of um, that we're that we're seeing today, and I and you know so much of it is a manifestation of how polarized we've become and how gridlocked our our nation has become, which you know again in in Weimar Germany, it, you know if the if the right wing Free Corps hadn't made a deal with the with the German government, maybe Germany would have been a Soviet republic. Who who knows? I mean that's how far apart the 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 parties were, and there was the the, the middle. The, the middle ground grew smaller and smaller and was finally extinguished and unable to, to participate in government anymore. And then you just had the extremes. Um, we have uh, from Catherine, um, maybe you could tell us a bit more about your protagonist. What are the decisions he makes along the way? Does he ever realize that he's gone too far? Mm -hmm. This is the this is this has been the heart of this story, and and what was so much, um, what was so gratifying for me as a novelist to write and to be in his head, because I really I really needed to understand the the workings of his mind and how he was processing what was happening to him and what forces were operating on him. Um, he comes from the, he's he's a fundamentally decent young man, and. Um, I had this experience as, as the author in creating this character. I'm creating someone who, on the one hand, you, you understand and you, you like him as a young, young man and as a, as a boy. Um, and then you, you don't like him at all. He becomes a very distressing character when he, when he uh, takes on the, the mantle of uh, the early fascists. Um, and um, so it, it, it was fascinating to, to track his journey of how, how this young man, he was a man of privilege, a man of privilege. Uh, his father was a magistrate, the, the family lived in a mansion, they had all the benefits of, um, uh, of the good life in, in Germany uh, pre and post-war. Um, and it, it was an opportunity for me to explore how um, how seductive the the uh, the, the message uh, the the radical message of the of nationalism and the right um, was for uh, for for young people who who took this on so and the you know that this letter from Frau Rodnow that's one catalyst that's a very substantial he takes this letter with him to prison and has no idea he he, he what it means it. it He's, he knows it's important, but he, he is, it, it is a very slow process um, for him to, to come to understand the era of his ways. Um, he also, in, in prison, uh, his cellmate is a man named Puck. And this is, a, this is not a real character. I created Puck. But he, is, he and, and Ernst engage in some very interesting philosophical repartee. Um, and Puck is another agent of his um, of his transformation. Um, the uh, the other characters before that are all real people, and I, um, I what I indicate in the book. If when you when you look in the book, you'll see the cast of characters, and there's an asterisk near each of the people who are real people from history, and these are these are their real stories of what they what they did. Um, Puck is not real. Puck is a is a created character. Um, but I, it, Ernst is a reluctant um, rescuer. By, I mean, a, 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 he reluctantly turns from this evil. And, and it's a, um, I, I found it an interesting process as an author to try to reconstruct this dramatic change in his personality and in his beliefs um, in a way that's both believable and gives us some understanding of how this is a human phenomenon. He's not a monster. He believes monstrous things, but he's not a monster. And he is able to then um, turn, his, turn his life around. <laughs>
in a dr rather dramatic way. Thank you. Um, from George, the upstander idea is something I've taught and worked with. It feels like we've got a lot of people standing up, but I worry about missing or having missed a chance to stem the tide of extremism. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying, George, because I feel that almost every day. Um, I, it, the, the question that, is, that comes up for me is, is am I doing enough? And what is enough? And at what point do, do you have to escalate that intervention? And, and, and I mean, at, you know, at being, being in the resistance against these uh, sort of horrible and destructive and, and racist ideas that are afoot in our country um, is, it, it's, it's challenging and none of us and, and well, as I said before, we are all bystanders. I think we have to just come to terms with that. We we and and uh, we need to find the way that we can um, we can resist these uh, these negative forces um, that are that are going to work. And it, and it, it it's a work in process. It, it, and and I think as circumstances change and as the events of the of our times change. Um, it calls upon us to re reevaluate what our strategy is, what our um, how much we're how much we're willing to um, in to uh, to in, invest in being an upstander and not a bystander. So it, it it's challenging. I I struggle with that every day. <laughs>